Thank you. Glad to be here on a Wednesday night. Oh my gosh. I was going to do something, but y'all, y'all are going to force me to do something. If I get any less interaction than what I just got, I swear I will walk up and down the aisles. I will go full Marty Blackwelder on everyone in here. I will stand on chairs. Don't make me do that. I shouldn't have said that. Y'all just want to do it just to, just to watch me. Listen, listen, church is, this is not a spectator sport. Come on, you're supposed to be engaged. You're supposed to be engaged. And so if I don't see engaged looks on your faces, I'll be like that teacher in school. If I see you nodding off, I'm going to zero you out. I'll just stare at you until, until we get some attention this way. Let's be intentional when we come to church. Man, God wants to speak to you. All right, let's not play church. Let's not come here because this is what we've been doing for the last 22 years. All right, let's come intentional. Man, God, this is the season in which we're living. God's got a very specific word for you, and he wants to speak it to you tonight. I believe that with all my heart. So what we're going to be talking about tonight, if you don't know, my name's Landon. I'm, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. Honored to get to, to serve with you guys, uh, to, to see Jesus and this message of the gospel get spread in this community and beyond these four walls in our state and the world. You know that we're impacting nations from this place. Did you know that? That's what you're a part of. That's what you're a part of. So that's exciting. So what I want to talk about tonight is uh, along the same lines that Pastor Nate has been talking about on Sundays. Um, he's, we've been in this series for a little while now, talking uh, in First John. And I want to be talking to you tonight about the Holy Spirit. In fact, uh, when Pastor Nate got started Sunday morning, he was talking about hearing from the Holy Spirit, hearing from God, right? Uh, very good stuff. And I thought, I already had some of this mapped out, thought he was going to teach that and I was going to have to change things up. But uh, Pastor Nate uh, is so good about finding these rabbit trails. And not only does he find them, he hammers them. So he got... He got far enough down to a few really good ones for us that I can kind of go down the one I was going to go on. So thanks, Pastor Nate. But uh, so good. Um, but tonight, uh, the title of the message tonight, if you're one of those note takers, and you should be, is Hearing Clearly. How creative is that? It's a very Pastor Evan-like title. It is just what it's about tonight. Hearing Clearly. How many of you could stand to hear a little more clearly from the Spirit of God, from God in your life? You can, and I can. Uh, fortunately, God wants us to hear from him clearly, so that's a good start, right? So if, if we know that he wants us to, he's made ways for us to do that, right? That's right. That's one of the times where I say, right? Question mark is assumed, and you say, right. I'm going to have to show you all how to act in church tonight. Okay, let's do it. Let's open up in John chapter 14. This is going to be a very, uh, this is kind of like a Bible school type setting. I'm so excited that Bible school is starting back up. Uh, yes, I love Bible school. Uh, that's, that's the vein I like to go in. We're going to just teach tonight. Sometimes we just need to be brought in. And, and a Wednesday night crew, you are ready to be taught the Word of God because we're growing up together, right? We're growing up together, and so this is just a very good setting for us to sit down and let's talk about God's Word together and grow up, okay? So in John chapter 14... We're going to start in verse 16. I'm going to read this out of the Passion Translation. Jesus is talking, and he said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another Savior. Well, that's a different word we're used to seeing in this verse. I read it in this translation today, and I thought, that's odd. Typically, you see the word comforter here, advocate. You see a lot of those different words for the Holy Spirit. Um, but, and I want to look into that in a second. But it says, the Holy Spirit of truth, he will be with you, uh, who will be with, be to you a friend just like me. And he will never leave you. The world won't receive him because they can't see him or know him. But you know him intimately because he will make his home in you and will live inside you. How convenient is that? He is going to make his home inside of us. um, And that's that's, uh, especially good for us because we're not walking with Jesus on the earth like they did. Right? So this is good news for us. I want to look into that word Savior here. And uh, this Greek word here, you've, you've heard this talked about even here in this church is that word paraclete or parakletos, okay? Talking about the Holy Spirit. And I want to read uh, what what it talks about here in in the footnote. 
It says the Greek word here uses parakletos. It's a technical word that could be translated defense attorney. So that's good. I mean, we, we've heard this about the Holy Spirit. He's our advocate, right? He's our defense attorney. It means one called to stand next to you as a helper. We also hear helper a lot when referring to the Holy Spirit. Various translations have rendered this counselor, comforter, advocate, encourager, intercessor, or helper. However, none of these words alone on their own are adequate, and they fall short of explaining the full meaning. The translator has chosen the word Savior, for it depicts the role of the Holy Spirit to protect, defend, and save us from ourselves and our enemies and keep us whole and healed. He is the one who guides and defends, comforts and consoles. Keep in mind that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, our Savior, right? The uh, Aramaic word here is parakleta, which is taken from two root words, prak, to end, finish, or to save, and eta, which means the curse. What a beautiful picture. The Holy Spirit comes to end the work of the curse of sin in our lives and to save us from its every effect. Wow, that is good news. That is really good news right there. Um, I thought, I just thought, wow, what a great footnote going into depth about what this w Greek word means right here. So good. So that's the role of the Holy Spirit in our life. I love it. I love it. And the awesome thing about the Holy Spirit is that how many of you are born again, children of God, you've given your lives to the Lord. This is a participation thing. Let's raise your hand. Um, okay, listen. So what the Bible says is that you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. He actually has taken up residence on the inside of you, right? So everything that we just read about what he does and his role, that is is what he is to you, right? Okay, so listen, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of be basic in how we talk about some of this stuff tonight, but I wanna challenge you right now, just like I did before, I wanna challenge you to hear the word fresh tonight. Sometimes when you come to church on a Wednesday night and we're teaching and maybe it may feel like a basic thing or something you've heard before, it's very easy even for someone who's a seasoned Christian to check out and say, I've heard that before, I don't need to hear that again, or man, another message about this, let, let's not do that. I heard Pastor Nate said this in a recent leadership meeting we had. If you roll in and out of church and you weren't challenged at all, chances are you didn't hear the word. That doesn't mean that the word wasn't preached. You just didn't hear it. And so let's be alert tonight, and when we come to a verse that you've heard a whole lot, let's be challenged to hear it in a different way, and the Holy Spirit is going to teach us tonight. He's the teacher. It's one of his roles. All right. So let's go to... Um, John, turn to John chapter 10, if you've got a Bible and you're turning to it. The, be, the thing I love about the Holy Spirit the most is he is the best at personalizing God's word to you. He's the best at it. So that, that's why you've heard a lot that, you know, a message can be taught and a lot of people hear different things. That's because the Holy Spirit personalizes God's word to you. And it's different from how he might do it to someone else. He's so good at it. All right, so just to be really simple, the outline I have tonight... I wrote down three factors that, that aid us in hearing clearly. And this, you know, this kind of can go for a conversation with anyone, hearing clearly from anyone. If I wanted to hear clearly uh, from, from Jake there, uh, the, these things would work too, okay? And so if we want to hear the Spirit of God, the voice of God clearly in our lives, there's just three, three factors I want to talk about tonight. The number one thing is voice recognition. It's important to recognize the voice that's talking to you. That's true. That is true. Let's read John chapter 10, verse 1. We'll read 1 through 5 in the New Living Translation. Jesus is talking. He says, I tell you the truth. Love how Jesus just tell. I'm going to tell you the truth here. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They'll run from him because they don't know his voice. Jesus is the shepherd. We are his sheep. Okay? So let me make that very clear distinction when reading this verse so we're not confused. He is the shepherd. Coincidentally, Jesus is the gate too. He's the gate, he's the shepherd, and, and he said that my sheep, I call them by name, and they know my voice and they recognize my voice. And so we say this a lot around here for a very good reason, and, and it's this simple. You have got to stop saying that you cannot hear from God. 
You cannot let come out of your mouth that I don't recognize the voice of God or I don't know what God sounds like or I've never heard God speak or I can't know his voice. That is opposite of what Jesus said in, the, in his word, okay? And so th- this, is a, this goes for every area of our lives. If what you're seeing in your life is not what he said, then stop saying what you have and start saying what he said until you have what he said. That's a mouthful, but, but it's just the truth. I mean, I'm teaching my kids this every day. You know, uh, they're, maybe they're having a problem with math or something. They say, I'm bad at math, or I can't learn math. No, we don't say, listen, anybody in the world, and everyone's doing this, they are really good at just saying what they have. Okay? It's a very, it's a very um, God thing to do something opposite of what's set up in the world system. The world is very good at just saying what they have over and over and over again, and we see them stuck in this cycle of what they have. If you don't want to experience or be at the place that you're in or have what you have right now, you need to start saying something differently than that. Your words are very powerful. The Bible says that life and death are in the power of the tongue, right? So we have got to start saying what he said, I am his sheep. I hear his voice. He leads me out. I follow him. I do hear his voice. You know, when when, when my kids are saying, I'm not learning math, I can't, I say, don't say that. Come to me and I'll help you. But what you should say is, I can learn math. I can do this. And and I don't just stop there. Listen, we can say a lot of things, but if it's not backed up by the word of God, then then it's not going to do us any good. I can. I can learn math. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? It's based on the word of God. So you know what else is based on the word of God? I I am his sheep. I do hear his voice. I hear it clearly, and I follow him. I follow him. This is elementary. This is elementary stuff, but we have got to do this. At some point, you have to make a decision that I'm going to stop saying the same things that I say all the time if I want to get to a different place than where I'm at. I can hear the voice of God. Jesus said I could. I hear his voice, and I hear it clearly. The problem is is that when we we continue to say that we don't know his voice, we don't recognize his voice, we open ourselves up to be duped by other voices that want to take his place. And we don't want that. We can hear his voice and we can hear him clearly. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8. We'll read verses 14 through 16. Along the same lines it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And you can read this verse backwards. Uh, If you're a child of God, you were led by the Spirit of God. And it's important to know that, that you can read it like this. And this is why you have to read, uh, read the Bible, read scriptures in context with other scriptures, right? I mean, there's times in the past, a long time ago, where I read this and said, well, it says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. I'm like, I'm not led by the Spirit of God. I haven't heard, I haven't heard him speak. I haven't been led by his Spirit. How, how many of you have thought that before? Am I a child of God then if I'm not led by his Spirit? no. The fact is you're a child of God because of what the Bible says. When you ask Jesus to, to move in, that's what he did. And you, and you called him Lord and Savior. You are now a child of God, so you're led by his spirit. The thing is there's a lot of Christians out there. There's a lot of children of God out there who just aren't following the leading, right? And so that, that's why this verse can read that way. All who are led by the Spirit of God, they are children of God. Whether you're, being, whether you're following his leading or not doesn't mean you're not being led. His Spirit is out in front leading you. And, and when we tap into and we recognize his voice and we make a decision to follow him, we're being led by his Spirit then. It goes on to say, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. Boy, this is good right here. I I, I love this. Look look at the language here in verse 15. You have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Look at the distinction between the spirits that that are being talked about here. The Holy Spirit in all the scriptures we've read so far, he is our guide, he is our leader, and he goes in front of us and leads us, right? This is the Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. It says, this other spirit, it makes you. 
And, and this, is, this is the spirit of the enemy, the spirit of Antichrist that Pastor Nate's been talking about on Sundays. This is that spirit. And that spirit wants to force, wants to push, and wants to pressure. It does not lead like the Holy Spirit leads. And this is how we recognize, this is one way to recognize those spirits. And it tries to be pushy and force us in to do its bidding. But God, God's spirit leads like a good father like a good father gets out in front and leads his children and his children follow, that's how God leads us. That's exactly how he leads us. The end of that verse says, for his spirit, verse 16, joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Uh, some translations say, uh, in that word affirm, to bear witness. For his spirit joins with our spirit and it bears witness. Uh, that's kind of a legal term, a more biblical term. We don't, we don't say Something like, well, that really bore witness with me. We think, you're really King James. <laughs> Can you just talk in normal human language? But, but really, that's the, <laughs> that's the best way to describe that. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. So when, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and the Bible says that you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, he now takes up residence on the inside of you. Right? And let's go on here before I get ahead of myself, but I want to read this first in Proverbs 20, 27. It says, The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, the candle of the Lord. It searches all the inner depths of his heart. This is important to know because if you haven't heard this before, and I'm sure you have, you are a spirit being, right? Like, at your very core, you are a spirit who has a soul which contains your mind, will, and emotions, and you live in a physical body, right? So at your core, you are a spirit. You're a spirit. And when you make Jesus your Lord and the Holy Spirit takes up residence on the inside of you, now he is in there, right? I, I know that like in here, not in my esophagus, not in here, at the core of who you are, he is taking up residence right with your spirit right there, right? That's where he is. So put simply now, God's direction to you, God speaking to you is going to come from the inside instead of from the outside, all right? And, and a, a lot of a lot of what we've gotten into, and a lot of, even as Christians, a lot of what we can slip into is being very head-led and, and really relying on our own intellect, on our reason, on logic. And, and there, there's certainly a place for common sense in our life, but when we totally decide to neglect to go to God and ask him about things, we're not going to be able be very, to be trained very well to be led from right here. This is where we need to be led from, right here. He doesn't appeal to our intellect. He doesn't, he doesn't inject thoughts into, into our mind. That's not how God communicates with us. He speaks to our spirit by his Holy Spirit. He bears witness with our spirit, and I'm going to show you how here in a second. But the enemy is the one who comes and he tries to plant thoughts up here, right? Uh, the Bible talks about their fiery darts, and he tries to get in here. See, he's got no access to your spirit. The enemy doesn't have access to your spirit. And so the beautiful thing about God communicating to you there, the enemy has no access to that. That's why he comes at you right here. But that's why we have to not rely on our logic, our intellect, what we think we know, what we've learned. We need to rely on being led by the Spirit of God who lives right here on the inside of us. Say amen if you're with me. Come on. All right. So uh, one of the things that Brother Hagen, Brother Kenneth Hagen said, he said, we spend most of our life in the mental and physical realm says, many of us have developed our intellect at the expense of our heart or spirit until our intellect has become the dominant force in our life. And our spirit, which should be our guide, has been kept locked away in prison, so to speak, and has not been permitted to function. Man, that's so true. Uh, and, how, and how much of the church is living this way? I mean, I, I've been guilty of living stretches of my life this way where I only kind of appeal to what's, what's up here, what's best. And really, it's a dark place, and what you'll, you'll find yourself down a road where you've been making all the decisions based on what you know. And the problem with even thinking that, well, I'm led by the Spirit because I know God's Word, I know what it says, you might have known what it says, but if you're not knowing what it says, the Holy Spirit has nothing to ping off of at that time to bear witness with you, right? Right? Um, one of the examples I heard in a message uh, from Keith Moore, he was talking about he had a decision to make, and he, I mean, he was taking uh, days. I don't know if it was a big decision or what. It was, it was a while back. 
uh, when I heard it, but um, he had this decision to make, and it was going on days, and he continued to just think through all the scenarios. He continued to think through trying to, trying to reason it out, what the answer might be, what he should do. And finally, the Lord brought to him kind of this picture of someone, you know, in a file cabinet, and they were just going through all these files. And they go through all the files in the cabinet, and they didn't find anything, and they go back, and they go through it again. And he said, this is what you're doing right now. You're going through all the things up here, and you're just spinning your wheels, and you can go through that 500 times. You could just go ahead and flip through there a million and one times. The answer's not there. You're not going to find what you're looking for. And so when we just sit around and spin our wheels, you know there is an answer. There is someone who knows. There's someone who knows exactly what you're looking for. And one of the other factors we're going to talk about here in a second on how to hear clearly will help us and hone in on how we can hear his voice. How many of you have ever, um, you know, uh, you've heard, man, I can hear the voice of God, and, and you're out and about, and you feel like you heard God speak to you, and you're like, well, was that me? You know, we, we make a joke, was that me? Was that, the, was that the jalapenos and sausage pizza that I had last night, like something rumbling in there? Uh, but you feel like, was that me or was that God type of thing? I think we've all probably had that. And the reason that you think that is that the voice of God to you is going to sound a lot like you. It's going to sound a lot like, like you because, again, the Holy Spirit is now speaking to your spirit, right? It's speaking to your spirit. And uh, once you're born again, your spirit's being influenced by the Spirit of God. It's that simple. Your spirit, once you're born again, becomes a safe guide because you are now born of God's spirit. So when you think, was that me? I don't know. Why don't you just ask yourself, does this line up with what God's word says? If it does, then that's God. It just sounds like you. You know, um, the inward witness, and I'm, tr- I'm trying to, oh, going back to that scripture we were talking about, bearing witness. You know, have you ever heard of the Holy Spirit as the inward witness? The inward witness. And really, this is one of the, uh, aside from God's written word, I mean, I'm telling you, and we're going to talk about this in a second. When you open God's written word and you read it, This is one of the main ways that God will ever speak to you right here, is just reading. This is his word, and his word speaks. It's alive, and it speaks to you. And we'll talk about how if you're not doing this, you're not going to be hearing much else from God. Um, But the inward witness is is the other main way that God is going to speak to you. It's not like an audible voice speaking to you. It's a witness. It's something on the inside of you that you've heard it like, uh, don't do this, or, or, or it's like a check or a red light, like, don't, just stop. You know what I'm talking about? Or, it, you know, a lot of people have referred to it as your conscience. Your conscience, just like, I don't, I don't know about that, I'm not going to do that. Or, you know, it might be against logic, against reason, but you feel like you should go ahead and do something. That's being led, that's an inward witness is what that is. And, and this is how God leads, you know, and I've had many examples in my life, and I'm sure you have too. Um, one of them I remember was back when, I mean, this was probably, uh, my wife and I have been married for 16 years, so we were probably been married for a year or two. We were 20, 21, and um, I remember we got in this fight, not a fist fight, just like, you know, an argument. I feel like you got to really, you know, she won, yeah. No, I did hit her in the face one time, though, and... Oh, wow, that came out like everyone's like, oh, my gosh. No, I was putting one of those little trampolines together, you know, in our house, and she was down here, and, you know, I'm trying to attach this spring, and it just came off, and I, pow! I mean, right in the face. She is good, though. It was no biggie. It's the only time. That's the only time. So, anyway, we were arguing, like, you know, a husband and wife can do, and she, she left, However many of you have just left the house in an argument, don't raise your hand. Come on. This is, no, I'm just kidding. I, I'm pretty sure we all have. We've just stormed out and left. She left. And, you know, after you argue, after you fight with your spouse or something, and things, they calm down, you're like, that probably could have been the dumbest thing we could have ever argued about. I don't really know what it was about anymore. And really, you just want to make it right, right? You get to the point where you're like, that was so dumb. I need to make things right, Okay all of you are like, no, I do not feel that way. (laughs) They need to make things right. I'm glad you're in church tonight. Y'all need this. You need this. But, you know, I said, so she left. I had no idea where she went. So this was just a few minutes, and I got in the car, and I wanted to go find her and make things right. And so um, 
I said, Lord, Holy Spirit, just lead me to, to where she's at. I have no idea where she's at. It's not like she had this spot she went to. You know, it's the first time this has, ha- this has happened. Um, and uh, I, I didn't know where she was at. And I just said, Lord, just lead me. And he didn't, like, tell me, go here. I didn't hear any of that. Uh, I just kind of got an Edward witness to turn this way and to drive down there and then to turn here. And there she was. That's, that's the inward witness. And you think, well, you didn't explain that very well. That's what, that's what the inward witness is like. I just followed the promptings on the inside of me. And, and here's, the, here's the thing. I asked the Holy Spirit to lead me to her. I didn't, and here's one of the problems that we have. We tend to neglect and to leave out the Holy Spirit on a lot of the decisions and a lot of the things that we have in our life. Why are we surprised that we're not being led by the Spirit of God if we're not inviting him to lead us? And so I asked, and not only did I ask, I asked him something that should make him very happy. According to his word, I was wanting to reconcile with someone. And wouldn't you know it, he led me right to her. And we reconciled. Oh, we reconciled. No, I'm just kidding. I got to make one of those jokes every time I'm in, I'm up here, just to see how far I can push it. But um, she, I asked Courtney if she remembered that. You know, that was 15 years ago or so. And she said, yeah. She said, it freaked me out. Because, I, she, like, again, she didn't, it's like she just drove to a random spot, and then I drove there too, you know, 10 minutes later. And uh, she, said, she said, that freaked me out. And, you know, back then she was like, I was, she was just learning about the Holy Spirit then. You know, she hadn't been, like, locked into church here for, you know, years and years at that time. And she was like, I, that, I was sold. I was sold on that. Being led by the Holy Spirit can do amazing things in your life. I remember when I came on here at the church, I was in a job, and, you know, it was great. I had, you know, I loved my job, loved the people I worked with. Things were good. Everything was great. I wasn't looking to leave. It was, it was awesome. And then this opportunity came up, and a lot of times you, you can be led by an opportunity because of how good it, you think it may be, and, and that's not how you're to be led. You're to check with the Lord on what you're to do, and he'll tell you what to do. And so everything was good, but I made, uh, I made the decision after checking with the Lord on what to do, and it's been an amazing decision, and God's been so good. But if you don't check with him, what you can do is you can look at all of the factors and, and all of the natural things, saying, I can't pass this up. I can't pass that job up. It's a, it's a 40% raise. And what we do is we tend to follow things that are not the Spirit of God, and they lead us down a path that he doesn't want us to go. He wants to lead us because he wants to lead us to green pastures. Jesus is our good shepherd, and he leads us out and into a good place. Amen? Because he's good. Say, he's good. He is good. So one of the second things, so that was, listen, we can recognize the voice of God when he talks to us. Say, I do know his voice. I hear when he talks to me. Tell yourself that. That's what Jesus said. So we can recognize his voice. So we're talking about hearing clearly. I know I can recognize his voice now. And one of the second things, the second thing I want to talk about is character. Character. Knowing the character of who I'm listening to provides context for what they're saying. Knowing the character of who I'm listening to provides context for what they're saying. If I know what God's word says about him, then I'll be able to more easily recognize when I hear something that's not in line with his character. The more I know about God, the more I know of God, the more I'm closer to God and know of him, the, e- the more easy it will be for me to recognize a voice, something that doesn't line up with what I know about his character. Pastor Nate said this yesterday. I'm still in it. He said, it's our fellowship that enables partnership. Our fellowship enables partnership. Like, I'm not going to go into partnership with anyone, with a spouse, uh, with, uh, with a business partner. I'm not doing any of that until I know their character and I'm convinced of their character. And the only way that that will ever happen is through true fellowship and through spending time with that person. That's it. That's it. The best way for me to get to know God and to know about his character is for me to open his written word in the Bible and to read about what, who he says he is. That's it. You know, this comes back to we talk about this has to be the final truth in your life. If you've made this the truth of your life, a lot of people like to say, well, this is my truth. 
What, what the crap does that mean? This is my truth. Like, this is the truth right here. If your truth doesn't line up with this truth, it's not truth. I mean, I mean, listen, like, if you want to say that's your truth and everyone just has their own truths, then what's really true? Okay? So if you want to live by what the Bible says, this is, this is the truth right here. You've got to, at some point, make this the final authority in your life. This is the truth, right? And once you do that, once you do that, you're now set up to learn about who God says he is, and you can take him at his word. He is exactly who he says he is. So that, that's the best way for me, to, for me to get to know God. And I'll even go so far as saying, until I get acquainted with and routinely spend time reading God's written word, I won't be able to detect the inward witness as well as I should. I have to feed my spirit God's word so that the Holy Spirit down there in the same place has something to bear witness to. Okay? Let me say that again. Until you become acquainted with and you know and you're spending time in God's word, you won't be able to, to detect the inward witness as well on the inside because you have got to feed your spirit God's word so that the Holy Spirit has something to bear witness to. That's how he works. He bears witness with your spirit. If he's doing that, what is he bearing witness to? What is he working with? What, what is in your spirit? It has to be God's word. And we'll see why here in a second. Turn to John chapter 14. You know, that, that's a good reason, too, why you should, you should never believe anyone who, who thinks that they're hearing from God, but, you know, they routinely neglect their Bible. I'd question that immediately. Anyone who thinks they're hearing from God or they've got a thus saith the Lord, but they're not opening their Bible, I'm running away from that as fast as I can. As fast as I can. John 14, 26 says, But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything. Say everything. And will remind you of everything I have told you. Man, isn't it good wouldn't it be great when you're not reading your Bible or you're at work or you're somewhere where you don't have your Bible right there? I know it's all on our phones right now, but to not even have to pull that out, but for the Holy Spirit to remind you in an instant when you need to know it of what Jesus said, that would be amazing. Here's the thing about reminders. I can't be reminded of something I never knew in the first place. For me to be reminded of something means that I had to have heard it or known it at one point. And so this is, this, I mean, he's not, he can't remind you of something that you don't know. You need to know what God said here so he can bring it to your remembrance. Amen. Amen. Uh, John 16, verse 12. Go a few chapters down. John 16, 12. Jesus says, there's so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. Talking to his disciples. Why, why couldn't they bear it then? Jesus wanted to tell them so much more, but he said, you, could, you can't bear it now. But yet we're, we're entrusted with the full word of God right here. And the reason that they couldn't is because, you know, at that time, Jesus obviously hadn't died on the cross, been raised from the dead. He, he didn't breathe on them to receive the Holy Spirit. And, and so since we have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, now we have the capacity to bear all that Jesus said because the Holy Spirit's there. Are you all with me? Are you following? When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. How many of you need to know about the future? You want to know more about your future? The Holy Spirit will tell you about the future. But you've got to recognize when he's speaking. And we've got to cultivate this relationship with him. Time in the word and prayer in its simplest form is positioning yourself to hear clearly from God. Time in the word and prayer. These, ba these things that we view as basic Christian principles, they are the things that are going to position you to hear clearly from God. The moment that we uh, stop thinking of these things as these tedious tasks that, um, you, you know, that are on our religious checklist and recognize them for what they are, they're an avenue to commune with God, we're going to be more inclined to make time for them. When you, when you realize that spending time here and talking to God positions you to hear from the creator himself about your life in specific situations, you're going to be more inclined to do this instead of it just being one of those things that you need to do to check off of your religious checklist. Ugh. Nobody wants to do that. Listen, 
Either we really want to know what God thinks about something when we ask him, or we're just pandering and we're just throwing out a line hoping to get a bite. Like, do, do we really want to know what God has to say about a situation, or are we just in the shower getting ready for work and say, God, I need to know about this, and we run out the door? How, many, how often are we doing this in our lives? If we really want to know something, if we really want to have the mind of God on something and know what he says about it, how are we approaching him to get that information, to get the answer that we're needing? Listen, I wrote this down earlier. Maybe our prayer life ROI is low because our eye is too low. For all of you non-financial people, maybe our prayer life return on investment is low because our investment is too low. Maybe you want more return on your prayer life. Maybe you need to invest a little more in there. Maybe you need to invest a little bit more in the word if you're looking for more of a return on it. See, God's going to meet us in trying circumstances, and he's going to be faithful because he can't deny who he is. He's faithful. He's good. But there's no need to wait for those times when we have access, clear and free access to him at all times. At all times. You know, and this, and this leads to the third factor that I'm going to talk about. We've talked about how to hear clearly from God. We need to know that we can recognize his voice, and we need to know his character so we know when uh, when he's talking to us, it's him. It's him, and we do that by getting into his word and seeing what he says about himself. And the third thing is proximity. I just talked about that a little bit. But spending time in God's word brings me near and gives the Holy Spirit something to draw on to reveal things to me that I need to know. Right? Right. This is why we need to be intentional in our time with God. This is, this is a big word for tonight. This is why we need to be intentional with our time with God. And I'm talking to myself because I've let some of these things slip in my life at different times. And you can certainly tell from the outside looking in. It, like if you knew about me, you could tell from the outside looking in that my time with God has slipped. You can tell that with anyone, really, if you know them well enough. So, I mean, here's the deal. If I wasn't intentional about the time with my wife, if I wasn't intentional about time with my children or my parents or any relationship that's important to me, if I'm not intentional about that, what's going to happen to those relationships? But, I mean, you're going to get out what you put in. You're going to get out what you put in. People just like to have a drive through God that they can cast a prayer out here to and move on, with, move on about their day. It's true. Pe- people like a God who looks like them uh, rather than a God who they have to be accountable to. And we, we want this drive through God. I'm going to throw this prayer out. God, what are you talking about? I asked you about this, and, and I never heard anything from you. When you asked and you were on the go, and it wasn't that important to you, clearly. We won't be hearing clearly when we're not positioned correctly. You won't be hearing clearly if you're not positioned correctly. Proximity matters. See, if my kid hollers at me from across the house, Dad, 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 Dad. And our youngest, no, our youngest keeps going. <laughs> so, like, you could be looking right at her. She's like, Dad, 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 Dad. So until you say yes, she's going to keep saying it like you can't hear her. How many of your kids are like that? Like, we started keeping count of... <laughs> so, a lot of hands. Started keeping count of how many times she says dad and mom. Fortunately, it's mom a lot more than dad, so that's good. But if she's hollering at me across the house, I mean, here's the thing. I might not be able to hear her. It might be muffled. Uh, Even if I can hear her, my answer to her, whatever question she's asking, might be muffled. She might not be able to hear. Now, now God's not here. He's not hard of hearing. He's not hard of projecting. But he cares too much about us to, to throw shotgun answers to our shotgun prayers. It's so much easier when my kid can come in the other room where I'm at and I can look her in the face and when I give her the answer to whatever she's needing, she knows my heart, she sees my intent, and I can give her so much more than just a quick answer that doesn't do much for her. And have y'all seen that? Did y'all ever see that movie back in the day, Bruce Almighty, where, where you know, I, don't, I forget how it worked, but all the, just everyone's, everyone's little prayers just got answered. It was chaos, And that's not how God works. That's not how God works. 
You know, many of us think we can ask, and like I said, we just ask and go on, all, go on about our lives thinking that we're just going to hear God speak to us amidst all the other distractions. The beautiful thing about God is that he is speaking, but the distractions are drowning out his voice. Like, we're, we're seriously fighting. We're, we're fighting ourselves in a couple of different ways. We're, we're just, you know, not spending our time with God throwing out things here and there, and God, because he's true to himself, he is still faithful to lead and to speak to us, but we're just allowing other distractions to drown them out when, he, when he's speaking. You know, there's a reason that Jesus got a way to pray. We, I mean, I see this. Let's look at a few of these real quick. Luke chapter 5, 16 says, but Jesus often slipped away from them and went into the wilderness to pray. Matthew 14, 23, you don't have to turn there. They're going to throw it up here. After the crowds dispersed, Jesus went up into the hills to pray, and as night fell, he was there praying alone with God. Mark 1, 35, the next morning, Jesus got up long before daylight, left the house while it was dark, and made his way to a secluded place to give himself to prayer. If Jesus couldn't multitask when it came to fellowshipping with his Father, then what makes us think that we can And these are just three that I pulled up as quick as I could. Jesus went away and spent time with the Father routinely. Just, just him alone in that time. And I've been guilty of this. And sometimes that becomes the problem with even, you know, reading, reading my Bible on my phone when all these other notifications are coming through and all these things. And here I'm supposed to be spending time with God and I end up answering an email or answering a text because it came up. And I'm distracting myself when God could be trying to tell me something right then. And again, if, if Jesus had to get away and he didn't try to multitask his relationship with God, why, why are we trying that? Why? You know, it takes us back to the story of Mary and Martha. Let's read it here in Luke 10, 38. It says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their journey, they came to a village where a woman welcomed Jesus into her home. Her name was Martha, and she had a sister named Mary. Mary sat down attentively before the master, absorbing every revelation he shared. But Martha became exasperated by finishing the numerous household chores in preparation for her guests. So she interrupted Jesus and said, Lord, don't you think it's unfair that my sister left me to do all the work by myself? Uh, this is just a soapbox and a side note. I don't know how y'all feel about this, but I don't allow in my household people to say that something's unfair. Unfair is just like, eh. Who, what, the, what is fair? Unfair, and then you, this is a teaching moment. I don't, I don't even say much about that, but I just, it makes me mad when I hear the word unfair. I guess that's, that's the deal there. But she interrupted Jesus. This is just a lot of bad ideas by Martha all at once here. <laughs> the Lord answered her and said, my beloved Martha. Man, what a nice, soft answer from Jesus. Why are you upset and troubled? Pulled, oh, she told Jesus to, don't you think it's unfair my sister left me to do all the work by myself? You should tell her to get up and help me. Just, to tear, just tell Jesus what to do. Ba say, bad idea. Bad idea. Uh, he answered, Martha, my beloved Martha. <laughs> Martha, my beloved Martha. Landon, my dear Landon. You know, that's a nice soft way to put that. Why are you upset and troubled, pulled away, by all these many distractions, are they really that important? I mean, this is a good question for us to ask ourselves. Are the things that really are distracting us from our time with God, are they really that important? I want to go ahead and answer that for you, for me, for all of us. They are not that important. And I say that very uh, confidently um, simply because I know the presence of social media and the time-wasting devices that we have available to us in our lives. I'm saying this supremely confidently. The things that we are distracting ourselves with are not more important than what Jesus has to say to us. I'm, I'm very much preaching to myself right now. I'm preaching to myself. Mary has discovered the one thing, say one thing, most important by choosing to sit at my feet. She is undistracted, and I won't take this privilege from her. Jesus called it a privilege to be undistracted. And it allowed Mary to discover the one thing that was important. So can we all agree that hearing clear, clearly from Jesus would be on the tops of our priority list? Like, 
If I, if I heard the voice of God himself clearly in my life on a daily basis, routinely, like, that's, that's tops. As long as that's up here and that's going on in my life, man, things should be rolling, things should be going like they should. I'm hearing from, is that tops on your list? Then, then, then what are we doing? What are we waiting on? It's available to us. It's available to us. You know, in that example I used about your kids screaming at you across the house, you know, there, there's another little part of that too. Um, when they say dad 77 times in a row without an answer, they're eventually going to get an answer because of their gold star <laughs> persistence. <laughs> you know, I, there's a few places in the word that this, where this is talked about. Um, in Matthew 7, you know, it says, ask and the gift is yours. Seek, and you'll just put up Matthew 7, 7 through 8 here. Ask and the gift is yours. Seek and you'll discover. Knock and the door will be open to you. For every persistent one, say persistent one, will get what he asks for. Every persistent seeker will discover what he longs for. And everyone who knocks persistently will one day find an open door. God isn't hard of hearing, but we're often short on persistence and perseverance. You know, at, at least in persisting, we know that God has the answer we're looking for. I mean, if she's persisting to get my attention. Maybe she needs to come in here and hear it from me where I'm at. But at least in her persisting, she knows that I have the answer that she's looking for. And if she keeps at it, she's going to get it. So, so if we're not going to at least position ourselves at the feet of Jesus and be intentional about our time with him, we at least need to be persistent in knowing who our help comes from and not stop until we get what he says. Amen. So to hear clearly, we need to know, we have got to know that we can and we do recognize the voice of our Father in our life. Say it again. I am his sheep. I hear his voice clearly. And I follow his lead. It, you would do well to confess some piece of that every single day. Every day. And we know his character that gives context to what's being said. And when we position ourselves at his feet on a regular basis, we are now in a place where he can speak to us clearly. We shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised that, man, I really feel like God hasn't been speaking to me. No, he has been. You know, I, I remember our youth pastor Ben taught a message a long time ago about he had this chair up here. And this is like your place with God. This is where you go and you spend time with God. And he's just... He, this is the place he's talking all the time, and he's, he's talking to you. But when you find yourself there uh, less frequently, what's going to happen is you're not hearing all that he's saying. You've got to find yourself in that place more often. That's where you have to find yourself. And I don't, we don't really have time to get into this. Um, we don't really have time to get into this, so I won't. We'll just wrap up here in a second. But a big piece, a big piece of what um, goes into all of this is talking about the Holy Spirit. When you're born again, the Bible says that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so a lot of you have taken that step. Maybe a lot of people we know have taken that step. There's another step after that. Yeah, you're born again. <laughs> you're on your way to heaven. You've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. But the Bible talks about the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, this is something that we talk about around here. And, and as a Christian who maybe hasn't made the decision to be filled with the Holy Spirit, this is something that we need to start taking very seriously. Because what we're doing when we say, okay, I've heard about this, but it's weird. Um, I didn't grow up hearing about this. It's weird. People talk in tongues. They do all this. So because we don't understand it, we then neglect it and say, I don't want any part of that. But again, this comes back to if we're going to make this the truth and the final authority in our lives, it talks very clearly about what being filled with the Holy Spirit looks like. Very clearly. And so Jesus, after he rose again from the dead, he came to his disciples and the Bible says that he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, they didn't receive the Holy Spirit like, you know, being filled with the Holy Spirit and the baptism in the Holy Spirit because he told them to go in Jerusalem and wait 
for that. Wait for the day of Pentecost. So that's how we know that the Holy Spirit, you know, we're sealed with him, and he, and he comes to dwell on the inside of us when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But, but Pentecost and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something far different. And so while the Holy Spirit is indwell, I mean, he's indwelling on the inside of us, the infilling of the Holy Spirit is something different. And what that's for, the Bible talks about it very clearly, there is power that comes upon you when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And so when you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, there is a serious lack of power in your life. And, and the reason that it's called being filled with the Holy Spirit is it's meant to come out and get on others. That's what it's for. And one of the most beautiful things is the thing that, that the enemy has used to freak even Christians out is this thing of speaking in tongues. But when you pray in other tongues, it's called a heavenly prayer language. The Bible, the Bible talks about how this is a heavenly language that, that is just between you and God. You don't understand it up here. In fact, you're, and this is the beautiful thing about it, we've already talked about how we need to remove this from the equation. And what praying in other tongues does is it removes this from the equation and now it's just right here to God is what it is. And this is, this is going to be one of the key things to you hearing clearly from the Spirit of God is when you are filled with the Spirit and, and you activate and use this heavenly prayer language that he's given you. It's not weird. It's biblical. It's biblical, guys. Again, we have got to get to the point where we say, I'm just going to believe what this says. And if I don't understand it, I'm going to keep digging. And I'm going to ask people who, who know about it. Like, I, I don't consider myself a weird, flaky guy. I'm very, I'm normal. And, you know, a lot of the stuff, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of people, a lot of churches, they've, they've taken certain things in the Bible and they made them extreme. And I, it, that makes me so mad. That it makes me want to kick things. Like, when people take the things of God and they make them weird and wonky and unappealing to other people, that makes me so mad. There's nothing weird about the Holy Spirit. There's nothing weird about praying in tongues. It's what the Bible says. It's what the Bible says. And you saw, after Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, he never before that preached to 3,000 men and they got saved that day. That never happened before but he had a power available to him then to do that. And we obviously don't have time to keep going on this, but I say all that because this is something that I want you, we have got resources, we've got books that talk specifically about this. And that's what I was getting to. Our, <laughs> you are so led by the Spirit. It's unbelievable. We are just, praise God. But Bible school, and so this is what I'm talking about. One of the first classes that we're teaching in Bible school is the Holy Spirit. I think Matt, are you teaching? Matt Nowicki's teaching in a class about the Holy Spirit. And I got to imagine that, you know, this is going to be in there. If not, it's going to be now. Am I right? Yeah. So um, if you need to know more about it, this is the perfect time and the perfect place to learn more about it. Get yourself in Bible school. Learn about the Holy Spirit. Things that you don't understand, you can't just give up and say, I, don't, I like this, I like this, but I don't like that, I don't know about it, and throw it out. That's not how the Bible works. That's not how the Word of God works. You take all of it. All of it. And so you need to school yourself or allow yourself to be schooled on that, learn about it, and you need to get filled with the Holy Spirit. There's power that's available to you. And this is one of the key things, like I said, the key tools that you can use to get in sync with the Spirit of God and have him speak to you and you hear it clearly. Say, I can hear the voice of God clearly, clearly. You can. You can. Okay, that's all I got for tonight, guys. We love you. Pastor, do you need to say anything? No, nope, just Bible school? That's it. I'm telling you guys, I... We're excited about this. If you've never experienced, you know, our Bible school, I mean, it's awesome. It'd be great to have a full room in there, and let's grow up together. So um, if you've been considering it, if you've been on the fence, take a step. I've, I've not, I'm not sure I've ever heard anyone say, man, I really regretted going to Bible school. That really sucked, <laughs> you know? No one said that. So if you're considering it, let's go ahead and make that decision and do it. Other than that, 
Uh, we love you guys. Hey, remember, we got Chip Brim coming on Sunday for two services. Yeah, it's going to be really good. So be here for that. Make plans. Say, I'll be here in the morning and at night. There you go. All right, we love you guys. Y'all have a great week, and we'll see you then.